the presentation tonight and into next week, God willing, is the challenging matter of, um, let me just get this out of the way, perfect, discipling today's young people. And let me show, share with you the approach I'm going to take as we explore this, this matter. I'm going to begin by, we're going to go on to talking about um, the purpose of this study, of this reflection. Um, we're going to look at the generational cohorts. Um, our focus is going to be on millennials. Who are millennials? What are millennials? What do they, what is it about millennials? Then we look at the church and millennials. Will, can they come together? And reasons for millennials leaving the church. We're going to look at this interesting, it's a passage from scripture, examining the church. Are we the gate or are we the gatekeepers? And responses, possible responses that the church may wish to consider. And it's important that when I talk about the church, I'm not necessarily zeroing in on Galilee, but the church in general, because the, the, one of the major problems that the church has is reaching out to, um, arresting the attention of, and keeping our young people. COVID, it was never great before, and COVID has just exacerbated a really challenging situation. So I'm gonna begin by looking at the generation years chart and looking at cohorts of generations, starting with the baby boomers. Now, these cohorts have been persons, people have been put together in cohorts, essentially by, from the year that they're born. It's done, the cohorts are comprised of people born within specific years, band of years. Why? Because they tend to exhibit certain characteristics. There's a tendency that they share, those of a particular cohort, they share particular tendencies, have similar features that are so similar, have similar features. They have such similar features that it's easy to put them together. And they have um, basically the same kind of conditioning. So the first one we're going to briefly examine is um, the baby boomers. Who are baby boomers? Baby boomers essentially are those persons who are born between 1946 and 1964. Um, to a large extent, many of the people, the older people in the church would, be, would fit in this category. Naturally, there are some born before 1946 referred to as a silent generation. But I think by and large, those who are in the church would be born between that 1940s, the older persons that is, would be born between 1946 and 1964. What kind of characteristic, characteristics do does um, this cohort exhibit? What are the things that they tend to like that identify them in contrast to other age group cohorts? Well, it said that one, they tend to be ambitious. They're goal oriented and competitive. No, it doesn't mean that everybody exhibit these characteristics, but it's saying that essentially it's something that is typical of those within this cohort. So they tend to be ambitious, goal oriented and competitive. They're focused. They believe in more work hours at work. They believe in working, not just getting, but working. Sometimes they tend to be a bit careless about wealth, meaning that they can amass it, but they're not always keen. You have a bank account and they take out different um, policies, insurance policies. And if you ask them about it, they say, well, I'm not too sure. I have to go check or something like that. They, are, they tend to be resourceful. They are doers and they like to get things done and they are team players. 
they're also bureau bureaucratic, meaning they like systems. They don't like hero scare them activity. They like system. That's generally the baby boomers. After that, you have what is called Generation X. These are those born between 1965 and 1979. They believe in hard work. They work hard. They believe in a balance between work and life. It's not all work, as with the baby boomers for the, great, for the most part. They believe that there needs to be a balance between work and play. They are very independent minded, flexible and straightforward, very direct, self-reliant. Thinkers, but they want feedback. So they, they will think even out of the box, but they also need feedback. Many are in debt, many a times because of the excitement of having credit cards, but not managing them properly. And it's said that some of them tend to be cynical, meaning that just because you say it doesn't mean that I believe it. And they want proof. After that comes the gener generation Y, the Gen Y the millennials. These are persons born between 1980 and 1994. In many instances, these millennials are children of the baby boomers. So there's a pretty much direct correlation between the generation Y or millennials and the baby boomers generation. This is the group that we're going to be focusing on. These young people are, tend to be socially driven. They're eth ethically diverse. What it means is really that their moral standards vary. They can be very flexible with morality. They are techies and they are curious. Whereas in many instances, the baby boomers tend to be afraid of technology. And in contrast, the millennials, oh, they are driven by, tech, by, by technology. You don't, for the most part, these persons are never without their mobile phones. They live for technology, and they are curious. You, you ask them about um, the various social platforms, they can school you on it. Educated and career-driven. The baby boomers, the parents for the most part, have placed a high value on education, and they basically see, have seen to it that their children who for the most part are millennials, receive sound education. They are financially conscious and therefore stable. If they are the children of these baby boomers, they would rather spend their parents' money than spend theirs. They are very conscious about what they spend their money on. And because they spend so much time in technology, Many of them are poor at interpersonal relationships. Their interpersonal skills need a lot of work. So they are, these are the kinds of persons who will sit around the dining table and text while having a family gathering, a family meeting, because they have to be connected, socially driven. And among all the cohorts, they tend to be less religious. But these are the ones who we need and we are losing from the church. Then there's the Generation Z. These are the ones born between 1995 and 2009. Tech savvy, meaning they're always connected. Uh, like, the, like the one before, they are poor at interpersonal skills because they're really into technology. They have a very short attention span. You have to catch them. And if you don't, if you catch their attention and don't hold them, they're gone. They're also ethnically diverse. 
come from all over the place. Not just your ethics are all over, but they are they come from different racial and national backgrounds. They are set. They do better interacting online than they interact in person. Like the ones before, not particularly really religious. They like to learn how they like to learn. Those before them say their parents, many times they're baby boomers. And they find you find that they like to study with the television on, with the phone um, connected onto the internet, and with their earphones plugged in. Several things going on around them, but that's how they learn. And to say, listen, you need to learn in a very quiet atmosphere. You're not speaking to them. And so they like personalized learning. Okay, so that gives you an overview. These dates, um, the year of birth, it's not cast in concrete. So on another site you go on, you may realize that the baby boomers, they actually go from 1945 to 1965 or so. So the dates aren't fixed in stone, but these are generally the years of the birth that um, categorize baby boomers, generation X, Y, and the Z. And then you will come on to the generation A as well. So let's look at the breakdown by age. What does it look like? Baby boomers. Baby boomers were born between 1946 and 1964. So now they're currently between 57 and 75 years old. In the US, there are, about, there are approximately 71.6 million baby boomers in the US. Baby boomers will be persons like me. Then the generation X. They were born between 1965 and 1979, 80. See, it's not, it, there's a little bit of flexibility there um, in terms of the years. And they're currently between 41 and 56 years old. And there are about 65.2 million of those generation Xs in the US. Gen generation Gen Y are the millennials. They were born between 1981 and 1994 to 1996. And they are, current, they are currently between the 25 and 40 age group. And there are 72.1 million of them in the US. Um, the Gen Y one, um, those between 25 and 29 years old, they are around 31 of them in 31 million in the US. And the Gen Y two, between 29 and 39, about 42 million in the US. Now the generation Z, this is the newest generation. And they are born between 1997 and 2012. And they're currently between nine and 24 years old. And there are about 68 million of them in the US. And then the generation A, the generation alpha. Now that starts with children born in 2012 and perhaps will continue through 2025 or maybe even later. And there are approximately 48 million of them in the US. The generation Y, the millennials, is the largest cohort. There are 72 million of them in the US. It's the largest cohort. And that's the one that we are really missing out on and losing in the church. And hence, the focus is on them for this presentation. This, and I'll, I'll tell you why. Why am I focusing on millennials? Because the church that does not attract younger adults won't keep growing. It's one thing to say we need, we need the children. Absolutely, we do. We need the older persons. Absolutely. But we also need the younger adults. Because if we don't attract them, we are, as a church, the church is going to be in problem. Part of the problem we find is that they seem to be repelled by the church, despite their best efforts. In talking with them, my, con my contention is, if we are going to talk about we need to have these persons in the church, we need to look at things through their eyes. So they are of the opinion that the church doesn't want them or the actions of the church militate against what the church is saying with their words. With the words, the church is saying, we want you, but the actions, they interpret to me that 
they are not wanted. No, according to according to Barna Group, Barna Group is a research facility. It's a research group in the U.S. A very established, a very prominent, and a very well respected church group. Um, research group. Barna says six in ten millennials who grew up in church have dropped out of church at some point. A lot of this is what is happening in the U.S. But the truth is. It mirrors also what is happening here in Jamaica as well. 60%, we are losing 60% of our young people. Millennials are unique in that they are both the church of now and the church of the future. That's very important to bear in mind. They may not be the leaders, but those of us in the baby boomer and all the age group cohort, we're moving off the scene. The church of now needs the baby, needs the, these millennials. They are the church of today and they are the church of tomorrow. They will be the church of tomorrow. They are both the young adults and the emerging adults. So these are persons in their early to mid twenties going up to about 40. This is the group we need to have. We won't always be around whether we think so or not. Now, the millennials are poised to become America's, Jamaica's most educated generation. You realize that these kids between say that 25 to 30, 35 age group cohort, they are among the most educated that we have ever seen. Because one of the things that their parents believed in was that if they're going to arrive, if they're going to rise, if they're going to make something of their lives, if they're going to achieve anything, they have to go to school. They have to have an education. So they have saw to it that they have gone through basic school. They have gone through primary and prep school. They have gone through high school and they take them through university. So the millennials tend to be much better educated and much higher educated than their parents than, and than all the generations before them. They constitute the largest generational cohort. And this is sad, but real. Only 13% of millennials consider any type of spirituality to be important. Now you see the challenge. Many of them have grown up in church 60% of them have dropped out of church. And one of the reasons why they have dropped out of church is because from their perspective, spirituality is of little importance. Education is a new religion. So they not only want to have a first degree, but they are doing online courses to better equip themselves. They are going on to masters and some certainly have set their, their sights on achieving PhDs. What do you want to do? They want to lecture, they want to be involved in various spheres. And that's the group we need. And that's the group we're losing. And that's the group we don't have as much as we would like to. So now, in light of all that, having looked at what we have looked at, the church and millennials, can we, can we envision a time when the millennials and the church will find a place in each other's heart? Will the millennials come to the church and will the church embrace the millennials? What are the challenges facing both groups? Well, here's the reality. Our young people are leaving church at record numbers. COVID has not made it any better. In fact, for many churches, they don't even know where the young people are. They are not, now that churches have opened up, many of them are not coming to church. So the challenge is, where are they? They are leaving the church. Studies have shown that it isn't Jesus that they are rejecting. They are rejecting churches that aren't making themselves relevant to millennial culture. Notice that. 
the studies are showing that it's not that they have anything against Jesus. What they are rejecting are the churches because they do not see the churches and the offerings of the churches relevant to them. Most churches simply are not capturing and retaining the millennial generation. Why? Because the thinking of the millennials is that the sermons are superficial and the Bible studies are shallow. No, if there's any truth to that, we as a church are in trouble. If it is true that they contend that the sermons are just surface, they don't go deep, they don't reach them where they are, and that the Bible studies are little more than Sunday school lessons. This is an, a highly educated group that we are ministering to. How can we capture and retain them if this is their critique of the offering of the church? It's, it's, it's a, the research says that millennials want a worship service that is contemplative and theologically rich. It, they want a church service that causes them to sit and to think deep within themselves with sound theology, not church doctrine, not uh, the authoritative structure, not the bureaucracy of the church, but they want services that in a sense are real. That is a challenge for us. This most educated generation desire to know deep doctrinal truths, even if they do not initially agree with them. Now, this is important. What they're saying is, challenge us. Challenge us. State it. State the theology. State the doctrine. Back it up with scripture. And let's discuss it. I may not agree with it, but the door, that doesn't mean that the, the door is closed. What it means is that you have opened the door for us to enter into a real discussion and conversation and not just, and not just say, well, this is how it is. You either take it or take it because this is how it is. That's not what they're going for. The challenge is that the baby boomers' parents have given them the education and know what they're saying with the education is that you believe that. Why? What is your basis for believing that? Show me the evidence you have. <clears throat> they view shallow churches for what they are, inauthentic and insubstantial. Inauthentic and insubstantial. Basically, what they're saying is that the sermon, the messages, the offering are light. The ministry is light. There's nothing to it. It's almost, um, it's almost so routine that we can recite it. There's nothing new to it. There's no depth to it. There's no richness to it. And I can't waste my time going to church because it's really just a waste of time. These are some of the, no, these are comments and views coming from the group itself, the millennials. This is not the church's thinking about them. This is their thinking about the church. Now, many of us will see them as being rebellious. But the question is, are they really rebellious? Is there truth to what they're saying? What are some of the reasons why millennials are leaving the church? And again, this is coming out of research conducted among the millennials. Why are you leaving the church? Several reasons. They declare that they don't feel respected. It, they believe that, yes, many of them have a very low work ethic. They have a sense of entitlement because the parents have cars. They believe that the parents ought to ensure that they have cars as well. 
the things that they go for, those who are older, many of, them, many of whom are in the church, laugh at them. We laugh at how they dress, the lack of coordination. And we laugh at some of the things that they say and the things that they get excited about. Or we just make fun of them because of their choices. And what they're saying is that, like anybody else, they want and deserve to be respected. You may not always agree with the positions they hold, but because they hold those positions does not mean that they ought to be disrespected, written off, abandoned, and basically forgotten. They claim that they don't feel respected. Remember, this is not about the young people at Galilee. This is about the group, the cohort themselves. And as I go through, the challenge for us is not to find a way to say, but that's not true. Uh, you know, I don't do, it's not about that. It's saying, look at them, listen to what they're saying, and then say, listen, how can we adjust within parameters, of course, so that we can show them the kind of love and respect which they feel they don't get. Many say they don't feel accepted. Many churches are afraid of the word acceptance, fearing that accepting someone is the same as condoning their sinful behavior. Now, this is, a, this is something that um, as church, I think we need to struggle with. And certainly, the case of the woman caught in adultery in St. John chapter 8 is something we probably need to reflect on very seriously. Those in the established religion wanted to basically kill the woman, do away with her. Jesus' words to her was, I don't condone, but I don't condemn. I don't condemn you, but stop sinning. I don't condone that behavior. Now, if acceptance is to be extended to those whose conduct we do not condone, how do we go about that? And many a times, that is where the challenge comes in. How do we accept the person without giving license to the sinful behavior. And many a times, if, if there's truth to this, we, we go too far in so condoning the behavior that we make, we're not careful about the distinction we made between condemning the behavior and condemning the perpetrator. So they don't feel accepted. Many contend that they don't feel they don't feel understood. Millennials are deeply concerned about things older generations may not have given much thought to, such as environmental and social justice issues. Failing to hear their perspectives makes it harder to build relationships. You know, they are some persons who wonder in the whole matter of the environment, care for the environment, management of the environment, why is the voice of the church so muted? Should the church not be among the leaders? Should the church not be in the vanguard of the fight to save the environment? Does not the scripture says the earth is the Lord's? Don't we see ourselves as stewards of this world? So if there is a gener if there is a move to save the environment, to clean up the environment, should how involved is the church in that? It's one thing to complain about people throwing things in the gullies and destroying the beaches. But what is the church as a community doing about that? Where is the voice of the church, many argue, on, social, on matters of social justice? 
the street people, what are we doing about supporting and assisting them? What are we doing with the concerning children who we have in children's home? What is the role of the church in all of this? So they feel they are not understood because the issues that are of importance to them, they don't perceive as being of importance to the church per se. They don't feel discipled. A misconception about millennials is that they want an easy faith. The truth is they want to go deep in their spirituality. They are thinkers, not there. They are thinkers and will not suffer careless thoughts and opinions. They want direction, thoughtful and honest answers. Again, this is a challenge. They are not prepared to believe it because those teaching them believe it and are passing it on as worthy of their belief and endorsement. They are basically saying, why? Talk to me about it. Talk to me about the, the, the death of Jesus. How do you know that he just didn't pass out? Talk to me about the resurrection. Talk to me about this whole concept of three days and three nights. Talk to me about it. Talk to me in a way that speaks to my mind as well as to my spirit. Just giving me the old cliches and the regular adages is not enough. I want to think, I want a faith that is rational, that is spiritual, that is not irrational. They want deep, they want depth. They do not believe, they don't see church as being relevant to their lives. Notice, it is church, not Christ, not the Bible. It's church. We, the church, wants them. And their response to the church wanting them is that we don't see the church as being relevant. Now, according to Barna. Among millennials who say attending church is not important to them, 35% claim church is not personally relevant. They see no connection between Sunday morning and Monday through Friday. So the challenge for us is to prove them wrong. Now, making connections is, ab is absolutely critical, not just for millennials, but also for the people in the churches, in the pew. Part of the problem with our faith is that it is a disconnected faith. We preach, but many times we do not see how what is preached and how what is taught is connected to everyday life. And that's the challenge. What they are saying is, listen, help me to see the connection between what goes on in the church and living that out in the world, in the wider world, in the wider community. They see the church as unfriendly to doubters and people with mental or emotional issues. People don't talk about doubt, doubt much in the church. And they believe it's not okay to have doubts in a lot of churches. Millennials are anxious and depressed, and they believe that the church is in denial about this and needs to do more to help them. Millennials are doubters. They are doubters. Interestingly, when they were little children, they believed everything their parents told them. As they got older, they believe but question. And now these young people, these young adults are basically saying, hey, listen, we hear you saying that, but is that really true? 
Is that really so? They're not saying it's not true, but they are taking everything now with pretty much like a grain of salt. And they want to say, okay, show me how you got there. Take me on a journey with you. But the journey isn't just pointing out. The journey is also answering questions that they have along the way. So it's not that they don't believe what you're, what they're saying is, give me the evidence, give me the proof. The fact is that these young people have been bombarded with lots of messages coming from different avenues, different, different areas. And in, excuse me, in so many instances, the messages are conflicting. So instead of believing one or the other, they tend to doubt. And it makes them very depressed because life is depressing. And they want to know how can we live in this world? They can't get to university because their parents can't afford the fee. They fly all the way across the world because that's affordable. No, there is war going on. And what do they do? Life is difficult. Life is confusing. Life is filled with anxiety. Life is filled with depression. Life is filled with fear. How do I deal with this? Even as a Christian, how do I deal with it? I go to school, I have to take a taxi, but I'm fearful. What do I do? Do I take a weapon in my bag just in case to protect myself? What do I do if I'm being attacked? Is it okay for me to respond? What do I do? So there is so much mental activity at play. What they're saying is help us. Help us to deal with life. Help us to deal with reality. The problem, the problem bothering, us about, uh, bothering us about life is that life is happening around us. Help us to deal with it. Millennials see churches as overconfident about matters of faith and science. Faith brings knowledge. And yes, Christian faith is epistemologically sound, it means it's rational. But to them, faith in Jesus is not the same thing as belief that I have two feet. One is vastly more important, true, but the other is more obvious to their sense perception. I can see my feet. Millennials want more humility from the church. Not a humility of message, but a humility of authority. They say that the church's mantra should be, come join us, Jesus as the answer, rather than come join us, we the church have the answers. Hmm. I'd, I'd be very keen to hear your feedback as we go along. Let me just finish this. Millennials see churches as overprotective and legalistic. Millennials believe churches across denominations tend to have. Hello? Millennials see churches as overprotective and legalistic. Millennials believe churches across denominations tend to have rules that stem from legalistic fundamentalism. No drinking, no this, no that, rather than preaching the gospel. So it's not that they're saying that rules are not important. What they're saying is that the church tend to have gone overboard in seeking to protect the status quo. And in protecting the status quo, they tend to be very legalistic. And so faith is a matter of do's and don'ts instead of the gospel. And we've mentioned this. They see churches as boring uh, or shallow. They believe that churches dumb down their message and relax the standards of righteousness to which Jesus called us in an attempt to appeal to a wider demographic, which often fails to get across the breadth and depth of our faith. This result can be shallow and boring. Basically, what they're saying, they want faith that is deep, that touches them, that reaches them, that speaks to the itches, to the to the itches that they have, the, the, you know, 
They have places that each and they want it scratched. It must speak to them in the here and now, in the reality on the rough and tumble of life. They want churches that speak to them instead of church talking about church. They want church to talk about Jesus and Bible and scripture. So basically what you're saying is that they want theological foundations on which they can stand. Millennials are described as America's and perhaps even Jamaica's least religious generations. They are leaving church at record number. They are highly skeptical of organized religion, but they are still thirsty to find meaning in life. Studies show that it isn't Jesus they're rejecting. They are rejecting churches that aren't making themselves relevant to millennial culture. I'm gonna stop there because I would love to get um, your feedback. Next week, next time, I'm going to go on to talk about the gate and the gatekeepers, but I don't want to show my hand just yet. I have said much and I would really appreciate getting your feedback. I've given you a mouthful. Everyone just say the truth.